On a cold December evening in 1897, an audience piled into the Adelphi Theatre, settling into its plush velvet seats and enjoying the warmth radiating from their fellow theatregoers. As furs were removed, drinks bought and programmes thumbed, an excited buzz filled the air. Patrons were looking forward to seeing the best of the best grace the stage of the Adelphi, with the biggest star at the time, William Terrace, featuring as part of the evening's performance. However, as time ticked by and the 8pm stage time drifted past, the audience began muttering and wondering what the hold-up was. However, little did they realise that backstage, life was imitating art and their much-beloved hero was fighting for his life. Today on Macabre London, we uncover the murder at the Adelphi Theatre. And welcome back to another episode of Macabre London. I'm Nikki Druce, your host with the silent G, and today I'll be taking you on a journey down another of London's grimy back streets to uncover a macabre tale from the city's past. And today we're treading the boards of the Adelphi Theatre on the Strand to reveal a tragic tale of jealousy and paranoia that results in murder. However, before we get into today's episode, if you're new here and you want to see more videos where we deep dive into some lesser known historic tales from London's past, and in fact, all over the world, then please don't forget to subscribe or follow so you never miss a new episode. If you aren't new here and you regularly enjoy the show and you want it to continue, then please consider supporting me on Patreon. The link is in the show notes. There's loads of bonus content over there, including an extra podcast every fortnight with my long-suffering other half called Having a Problem, which is lots of silly fun with a bit of history thrown in. And there's lots of other fun, spooky bonus bits and bobs too. So if you sign up to Patreon, you effectively get an episode from me every single week. It's all very reasonably priced and there's literally hours of bonus content over there. So why not take a look on patreon.com forward slash macabre London. I'd love to see you over there. During the busiest time of year for theatre, an event happened which would rock the acting world for decades afterwards. The events which happened on the 16th of December 1897 would change things forever in the acting community and go on to fuel some of the most compelling ghost sightings in London, which would span decades. So to begin today's tale... Like any good stage play, this real-life tragedy contains a protagonist and an antagonist. And so, let's meet our two main leads and delve into their backstories to uncover this sad tale of jealousy, debt and hopelessness that culminates in a horrific end for both of them. William Charles James Lewin was born in St John's Wood in London on the 20th of February 1847. He was born to George and Mary Lewin, the youngest of their three children. George was a barrister and, well, Mary was a Victorian woman. William was not the most academically gifted child, but he did complete his private school education and went on to study at Oxford. But he was always far more interested in life itself than to bother taking a degree. He did a number of jobs after Oxford and took a stint in the Merchant Navy and travelled around for a while, but nothing fitted him, and leaning into his flamboyant and adventurous nature, he decided he would take to the stage. By the time he was 23, he'd met his soon-to-be wife, Isabel Lewis, whose stage name was Amy Fellows, and the pair had three children, two of which went on to create successful careers of their own in the entertainment industry. His son, Tom Terrace, became an incredibly successful actor in his own right and an early film director, working with the likes of Charlie Chaplin and creating 35 films during his career. His daughter, Ella Lyne, became a famous actor herself, becoming a darling of the Playhouse and an astute comedy musical performer of the Edwardian period. 
In his time trying to forge out a career within the acting world, William couldn't keep his adventurous side at bay, and so he would often ship the whole family off around the world. He balanced many short-term jobs on his travels, and it seems he couldn't stay in any one place for too long. In the mid-1800s, he took the whole family on a trip to South America and became a sheep farmer for a while. He interspersed these mammoth voyages with acting and returning to London for roles he managed to acquire. Eventually, when the acting work became more regular, the family returned to London full-time so William could take his place on the stage as a stalwart of the West End. From 1880 up until his death, William was hardly ever off the stage. He gained a name for himself as a dashing, swashbuckling hero, and so any play which required that type of character, William would always be cast, giving him the nickname Swashbuckling Bill. A firm fan favourite, directors latched on to the fact that Bill brought in huge audiences and many loyal fans would go and see whatever he was in, just down to his sheer charisma. This commitment to constantly being on stage made Terrace undoubtedly the most popular actor in England. This of course not only gave him a huge amount of fans, but an equal amount of jealous rivals who looked upon him with envious eyes, one of which was Richard Prince. At around 7.20 on the 16th of December 1897, William was headed to the stage door of the Adelphi to go to work. He was starring in the play Secret Service. Terrace was to take the stage by 8pm, but he would never make it. Little did the audience that were piling into the packed theatre know that their leading man would not be appearing, as in his dressing room he lay dying. As Terrace had arrived at the stage door that evening, he was approached from behind by someone he and another actor who was with him at the time thought was a friend. The man patted William twice on the back, but as soon as the first two blows were struck, Terrace realised this was no friendly greeting. He turned to see a man wielding a knife, and this third blow would go straight into his chest. William hadn't even felt the first two stabs, and it was all over incredibly quickly. The man calmly walked away and stood observing the chaos he'd just created from across the street. The theatre workers and stagehands came to William's aid, but it was too late. He had already shed a huge amount of blood. His colleagues carried him to his dressing room and propped him up on pillows and placed ice on his wounds. Two doctors were called for from the nearby hospital, but even these two professionals couldn't save him. He died soon after. As the audience grew restless, completely unaware of the real-life drama occurring outside, the police were called for and their attendance prompted an immediate arrest. The man who attacked William had just remained calmly standing across the street, making no attempt to flee the scene at all, resolutely accepting his fate of being arrested. So, who was this man, and why was he so angry at Terrace that he decided to take his life? The attacker confirmed he was Richard Miller Archer, otherwise known by his stage name, Richard Prince. Prince was envious of Terrace, but this was no distant jealousy. The pair knew each other and had even shared the stage together on a few occasions. Richard was born in Dundee in Scotland and was one of nine children. Born to poor parents, his mother blamed Richard being different on her accidentally leaving him in the sun while she was working in a field on a farm, which caused him to receive sunstroke. She said he was regretfully never the same since then. Sunstroke can cause permanent changes to the brain, so perhaps she was right. Richard didn't do well in school and left at 14 to work in a shipbuilder's, but he always enjoyed the theatre and so he applied as an extra for his local theatre company and secured himself some background work, 
appearing for a few years in the evenings on the stage. Being on the stage was much less physical strain than working in the shipbuilders, and so Richard set his sights on this new career to avoid the daily grind of splinters and hard graft. Moving to London with his family in 1875, the amount of theatres in the capital was bountiful, and this meant that perhaps the now 17-year-old could bag himself a leading role, or at least a bit part. However, his aspirations exceeded that of his talent, and he found that he was often regulated to background roles. He played the long game, and eventually people took pity on him and gave him small speaking roles. It was in one of these small speaking roles that William Terrace and Richard Prince first met. During a production of The Harbour Lights, Richard became acquainted with Terrace. Richard told William about how he aspired to be an actor like him and Terrace took him under his wing. However, the honeymoon period was over pretty quickly when Prince said something during a rehearsal which upset Terrace and Richard, in that instant, had ruined their relationship. William had Richard dismissed from the production. But William wasn't cold. In fact, he was well aware that there may have been more problems bubbling under the surface than Richard was even aware of himself. By this time, Prince had allegedly begun abusing alcohol and it seemed he was spiralling out of control. Knowing that he had taken his job away, Terrace made sure that Richard was looked after, making sure he had payments paid to him each month via the Actors' Benevolence Fund. And just like that, Richard Prince's stage career was over. He'd messed with the biggest actor in the whole country and, as such, had himself blacklisted from any theatre in the land. This left Richard devoid of the joy he had in his life and he had to go back to labouring in Dundee. As the years passed, the resentment grew in Richard's belly, burning like a fire which would eventually erupt in a phenomenal display of anger which would equally destroy the man who did the same to him. However, Richard's paranoia was out of control and the seething hatred began to take over. William Terrace, however, had almost forgotten about Prince. After all, what's a sheep to a tiger? But when Richard made a return to the West End in one last-ditch attempt to secure work, he believed that Terrace had purposefully ostracised him from directors. Richard still had an actor's pass, and when he tried to use the outdated piece of paper to gain entry into a theatre, they clocked that this was out of date and had him removed. So now, Prince believed Terrace had also banned him from going to the theatre. Later on that evening, Terrace went to the Adelphi and requested to see Terrace at the stage door. William, not realising that Prince was in the midst of a paranoid episode, said to send the man into his dressing room, probably thinking that it would be nice to see how Richard was. But this wasn't the nice reunion he was expecting, and instead Richard exploded upon him, and the pair were heard loudly arguing before Richard was escorted out of his second theatre that evening. Three days later, Prince was hoping to return to Dundee, but he'd run out of money and his sister refused to give him any more. He went to the funds office across the street from the stage door at the Adelphi and they couldn't give him any more money. The funds office were in charge of dishing out emergency funds to the poor in need, but Richard had run out of his allowance and there was nothing left to give. So in a rage that he couldn't return home, he had no funds left and his career was over forever in London. He took it out on the man he thought had ruined his life. As William Terrace lay dying in his dressing room, he didn't once blame Prince for the attack. Perhaps he hadn't seen his face clearly or maybe he felt some guilt for dismissing Richard from the play some years ago. One chilling thing he did utter, though, before he took his last breath was, I will return. 
But here seems like a good time to take a rest from the story and to tell you about another fantastic podcast, which I think you're really going to love. The Art of Crime is a history podcast about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. The latest season is titled Queen of Crime, Madame Tussaud, and The Chamber of Horrors. Now, when I heard this was going to be the title of this series, I was so excited. As you know, I've covered Marie Tussaud in the past, and I think her story is often overlooked despite it being incredibly fascinating. So I know I'm going to love listening to this series as it unfurls. Queen of Crime tells two stories. First, it chronicles Tussaud's long and distinguished career, starting in pre-revolutionary France and ending in Victorian London. Second, it tracks the evolution of the Chamber of Horrors, a showroom in her wax museum that exhibited macabre curiosities, including effigies of notorious criminals. You'll hear how Tussaud won patronage from the French royal family, narrowly escaped the reign of terror, and became one of the most celebrated showwomen in London. You'll also learn about the most divisive assassin of the French Revolution, the last man to be hung, drawn and quartered for high treason in England, and the glamorous murderer who attained notoriety as a modern Lady Macbeth. Subscribe to The Art of Crime wherever you get your podcasts, and I hope you're as excited to check this one out as I am. It's going to be great. Now, let's get back to the episode. After his initial arrest and capture, Richard Archer, who was now stripped of his stage name, had to attend his initial hearing. At Bow Street Police Court on the 22nd of December, just four days after the murder, Richard Prince was taken in front of the Chief Police Magistrate, Sir John Bridge. The Chief Police Magistrate, an archaic position which was only local to London, it's since been abolished, was responsible for administering the London Magistrates' Courts. Sir John Bridge held this position for nine years and during that time was known to be kindly towards those he sent to trial. Bridge was no stranger to having overseen perhaps the most famous playwright of the time, Oscar Wilde's trial. Sir John didn't agree with the warrant being issued for Oscar Wilde to arrest him for being gay – And so he adjourned the court for an hour and a half, safe in the knowledge this would afford Wilde enough time to flee the country via the last train to Dover. He knowingly signed the arrest warrant after the last train had left, in the hope this would stop Wilde from being arrested. The outcome of which is a story for another episode, and a digression we don't have time for today, but I'm just peppering in the information to let you know what type of character we're dealing with, which makes a nice change from our usual personalities we encounter in positions of power during this time period. Sir John took his seat in the court at around 2.30 in the afternoon, which was absolutely packed with William's many friends and acquaintances. Terrace's eldest son sat alongside the solicitor, Mr Sims, who was the prosecutor for the case. The accused was brought into the court and looked dishevelled and quiet. A friend of William's who witnessed his murder was first up to give testimony, then a police officer who attended the scene on the evening and arrested Richard Prince. Constable Bragg said Prince had mentioned many times on the way to the police station that he was blackmailed by Terrace for 10 years, and whilst in custody he seemed calm and collected and didn't give the impression of, as they called it, insanity. As this statement was heard by the court, Richard muttered, I should think not, under his breath. Prince did later confirm that his calmness was as a result of not knowing that Terrace had died. He thought he'd just wounded the man. However, the constable that recovered the weapon from the scene said it was so contaminated with Terrace's blood that he couldn't see the maker's mark upon it. This was clearly a vicious attack, and perhaps Richard was just trying to make himself believe his regrettable decision to rid William of his life was not real. After the short but brief hearing, Prince was put on remand at Holloway Jail until the full trial commenced. To assess Richard whilst he was in prison, and to see if he was affected by mental health issues, the prison doctor stated that whilst Richard was a talker, he said he was coherent and astute in all other ways. 
Nowadays, and with the advancement of medical diagnosis, we know that excessive talking is associated with a number of mental health problems, and the science wasn't advanced enough yet to help him. When questioned by the prison doctor about his motive for the murder, he answered, No one regrets it more than I do. Had my sister given me the half-sovereign I asked her for to pay my fare to Dundee, I should have left London instantly, and this would not have happened. Interestingly, Richard was insistent that the plea of insanity, as it was deemed by the court, should not be made on his behalf. He was happy to take full accountability for his crime and to receive the death sentence he would be inevitably given. He did counter, though, that the murder was not premeditated, despite the knife having been purchased six weeks earlier. But his landlady said she'd seen him using it to prepare food and didn't believe it was bought with the intention of killing William. It just happened to be the only knife he owned. He said the only reason he attacked Mr Terrace was because he denied him a conversation outside the Adelphi, which made him see red. He was upset that William had blackmailed him, but he didn't elaborate on what this entailed, only saying that Terrace had been instrumental in allowing him to be overlooked for a play at the same theatre. This story would change at the actual trial and would revert to the much more true events which unfolded on the evening. On the 13th of January 1898, Richard Archer was sent to trial at the Old Bailey, where he was initially going to enter a plea of guilty with provocation. Richard, by this time, had been ruminating on the events leading up to the murder, and he did wholeheartedly believe that he had been pushed to the outcome of attacking William Terrace because he had, in his eyes, ruined his career and, over the course of ten years, taken away his livelihood. The blackmailing of which he spoke is seemingly confused with blacklisting and there was no evidence that William Terrace had ever tried to extort the man. This paranoid plea would have 100% resulted in the death penalty being issued and his solicitor was aware that Richard was in fact not mentally well, despite his assertions otherwise. Eventually, the defence managed to get him to agree a not guilty by the way of insanity plea. It was obvious to the judge and jury that what Richard required was a reformative stay and medical help, and so he was put under the care of what was known then as the Broadmoor Criminal Lunatic Asylum, where he spent the rest of his life, passing away from natural causes in 1937 at the age of 79. Despite Richard being clearly unwell, William Terrace's friends and family were not best pleased at the outcome, with Henry Irving, an actor peer who was on a similar level of fame as Terrace, saying, Terrace was an actor, so his murderer will not be executed. Which may have been a reaction to many crimes within acting circles never being taken seriously by the police. So with the case finally over, did that now mean Terrace could rest? Apparently not. Staying true to his final words, he would indeed one day return. That just so happened to be, however, from beyond the grave. William Terrace's ghost has had several sightings in the area around the Adelphi Theatre, Firstly, the site where William died by the stage door on Maiden Lane, tucked behind the Adelphi, is said to have a ghost which appears from time to time, dressed in a top hat. In the 1920s, a man said he'd seen the ghost in the lane, and when shown a photo of Terrace, the man saying he'd not ever heard the story of what happened, confirmed that was who they'd seen. The next location that Terrace is said to haunt is Covent Garden Tube Station. Interestingly, the Grade 2 listed station wasn't built before the actor died, so it seems strange that a spectre would pick this location to roam when it didn't even exist when he was alive. So why would William choose to roam the lonely platforms late at night? Many tube workers have reported a man dressed in a top hat wandering along the platform late at night, One even said he was locking up the station when a man appeared in the aforementioned dress suit looking for a way out. 
The station worker apologised and opened the gates to let him out, but when he turned around to bid him adieu, the man had vanished. He then went to search for the man, but couldn't find anyone anywhere in the station. Now, given the area is and was frequented by theatre-goers and the top hat was popular up until the Second World War as a fashion choice for men on a night out, dressed in their finery, it may well have been a lost man that just happened to bear a resemblance to Terrace. However, I can't explain how he seemingly disappeared. That does seem supernatural. Other station workers have said they've seen the same spectre lurking around the staff areas, and one worker was so perturbed by the ghost that TfL carried out an official seance by a spiritualist member of staff to rid the station of its ghost in 1955. This seance managed to connect with a man named Terrace, and when they looked further into the name, they discovered his demise at the nearby Adelphi. This act of communication and polite request to go away please apparently did the trick as the ghost went quiet for a number of years after this. However, in the 1970s, the ghostly apparition started a new reign of terror, popping up again around the station, much to the terror of the new station workers who had not yet encountered the Covent Garden ghost. The station staff, however, soon began to accept that William had as much right to be there as they did, and so they just accepted that they were more than likely going to see him wandering around the place. But since the 70s, Terrace seems to have left the tube station, as no further sightings have been reported by station staff since then. But why would Terrace choose to be here, somewhere he never visited when he was alive? Well, rumour has it that before Covent Garden Station was built, his favourite bakers sat atop the station before being demolished to make way for the railway building. During the 1955 seance, Terrace didn't say why he was haunting the station, but perhaps he was just searching for one final sweet treat before he could rest. I couldn't find any records of a bakery being opened nearby, but I would love to imagine that there was, and he finally walked away with an ice bun and quietly dissipated into the ether, having finally acquired it. In a tale which unveils a complex web of envy, resentment, and the harsh realities of the Victorian era theatre world, it's easy with modern eyes to see the glaring problems the era had. Firstly, the terror of capitalism was creeping up on Richard, and as a man with what we can conclude to be most likely undiagnosed mental health issues, he struggled to operate within a system that was only ever going to condemn him, and this made it as hard as possible for him to survive. Even though, in part, Terrace did have some responsibility for removing his role, he didn't contribute directly to Richard's downfall. In fact, he more than likely lessened the blow by providing him with an income when no one else would even entertain him for a role. However, this kindness would become twisted and bitter in Prince's eyes. The courtroom drama that unfolded after the case did ultimately save Richard from death, but it was too late for William, who suffered at the hands of a failing system and became the scapegoat for Richard's anger, grief and resentment. Prince's deteriorating mental state and the acknowledgement of his troubled history with Terrace led to a plea of insanity, and this resulted in a balanced approach to his ongoing care, despite the heinous act he had committed. The decision to send Richard to the Broadmoor Criminal Lunatic Asylum, rather than imposing the death penalty, reflects a compassionate approach, recognising the need for reform and medical assistance, but this outcome left a sour taste in the mouth of the acting community, which had already felt the effects of being looked over by the police and treated unfairly. As a result of Terrace's death, this did force theatre managers to take stage door security seriously, and the provision of security at both entrance and exit for actors was implemented as an ongoing protection for those on the stage an improvement which sadly took a murder to implement. Perhaps this is why the ghost of Terrace was restless for so many years. Maybe he wasn't in search of baked goods, 
Perhaps he was trying to remind theatre-goers of the compassion and kindness he'd shown in his life, which sadly resulted in his death. Terrace, in some form, sought solace or perhaps closure in the places associated with his life and untimely death. Or maybe he himself was so filled with resentment at what had happened to him and his seeming lack of justice that he had to still make his presence known. Whatever the case, we'll never know, and perhaps all of it is just a trick of the eye on overworked TFL staff. What we do know is that whatever was causing William to come back from the dead has now seemingly subsided, and that the ghost of the swashbuckling Victorian actor seems to finally be at peace. for joining me for my first episode of 2024 i hope you enjoyed it and thanks for allowing me to take somewhat of a break in january so i could get ahead of the game for this year i've now got the episode planned for this year and there are a lot of interesting tales on there and you're gonna want to stick around for them if you enjoyed that episode and you want more of them then you can support me in a variety of ways including signing up to my patreon using the thanks button on youtube heading to my coffee page or checking out my amazon wishlist or buying some merch i also have my paypal link if you just want to bung me a couple of quid to say thanks and all donations go straight back into making the show If you head to the support me section in the show notes on the podcast or just click on the video info on YouTube, then everything you need is there. And it's not all about money, sharing the show around on social media, telling your friends, the usher at your local theatre about the show, all really helps me out and thanks so much for spreading the word. Leaving a five-star review is a wonderful help. A comment, a thumbs up, follow, subscribe is more useful than you know and helps the show to grow our lovable gang of ghouls and will allow me in the long run to bring you more of the haunted history we both love on a more regular basis. A big thanks to my amazing top-tier legendary executive Patreon producers, Christina, Christoph, Kate, Lisa, Mary, Ravel, Rose, Sally, Sam, Sarah, Terry, V and Veronica and all of our other patrons too. If you'd like your name read out by me at the end of every episode or your name in the show notes, then make sure you check out my Patreon, where you can also get exclusive episodes. It starts for as little as just £3 a month for two extra episodes a month, which is a bargain in my opinion, as they're usually over an hour long each time. So I hope to see you over there at patreon.com forward slash macabre London so I can personally welcome you to the Ghoul Gang. And lastly, thank you very much to The Art of Crime for sponsoring this episode. Make sure you check them out wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for joining me for another macabre tale from London's past. I've been Nikki Druce. Remember to stay spooky and I'll see you ghouls next time. Oh, it's nice to be back. Happy New Year, everybody, in February. I hope those New Year's resolutions working out for you. (laughs) I'll see you next time.